Hello and welcome to the Dwarf Fortress Wiki. I am Twisted Logic, and this episode is going to be about the movement of fluids and main game loop of Dwarf Fortress. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the thumbs up, let me know what you think in the comments, and subscribe for more videos. The term flow can be used to refer to several completely different things in Dwarf Fortress, like miasma and smoke and the mechanism by which uh, water and magma moves. Um, the two fluids that exist in Dwarf Fortress currently are water and magma. In some of the interviews that um, Tarn was involved with, uh, he, he had said that he wanted to add in other fluids, um, oil and blood. Uh, those are currently not part of the game. The other day I was um, playing around in my test fortress and I discovered this um, block update bug with water and uh, I was trying to figure out why it was happening and I believe that I figured it out and so I'm gonna come down in the article now to the fluids under pressure teleportation effect of water magma which has no natural pressure flows according to the rules of basic motion fluid water however can be moved by pressure when it falls down on top of a full 7-7 water. In addition, pumps can create pressure in both water and magma, and water entering the map from a stream or river follows pressure as well. Fluids moving under pressure do not just move to adjacent tiles. They also trace a path through other full tiles of fluid trying to move to the distant tiles. Fluids moving under pressure can effectively teleport through the other tiles that are already filled with fluid. When teleporting, fluids do not generate any flow. Neither will they push objects around. So this image right here is showing you a before and after. And if you look at it, what it looks like is that this water is coming down and then all of these waters are being, all of these sevens are being pushed over one and then up. But what's actually happening is this top seven tile is just teleporting right there. So it goes from here and it teleports there. When a fluid tries to move by pressure, it tries to trace a path through full seven seven fluids going down and horizontally, but not diagonally. In this way, it's like basic flow, except that the pressure works faster. Fluid from the source is teleported to the open space at the end rather than having to wait for an open space to open up at the source via normal flow. This is why, for example, diagonal squeezes in channels makes water flow slower. They block pressure, forcing it to only spread out sideways, and why rivers and streams on the map are usually full of 7-7 water until close to the edge of the map where the rules of basic fluid motion are draining the water off the map while pressure teleports new water from the source all the way down to the end. So think about that for a minute. You have a river going all the way across your map where the source of the river is. Those sevens, the seven water coming into that block is teleporting from that area all the way to the other side of your map where the water is then normal flow takes over and then it flows from there. I'm over here on this Game Sutra article. Um, this is a Q&A with um, Tarn Adams about the development of Dwarf Fortress. And I'm going to scroll down a little bit in this article. This will be linked in the description of this video if you'd like to check it out in more detail um, because I'm not going to read the whole thing. So what does the main game loop look like? In order to understand what's going on with the water teleportation bug, the um, block update, switch or bug uh, whatever you want to call it it's not very useful um, it's just something that could could trouble you or you might be able to like if you're sharing map with somebody else trick them in some way that's funny the game starts off with some announcement checks and considers auto saves etc a lot of the rest doesn't happen every tick every hundred ticks for instance It'll check job assignments and strange moods. 
Armies are moved around the world map. Every hundred ticks staggering from the job check, it handles uh, job applications by dwarves. A kind of invisible auction that is that it uses to manage various competing properties. When there's five dwarves that are that have no job, and you tell um, tell them to build a floodgate, which one of those dwarves is actually going to pick it up if they all have that assigned as a task? That that's kind of how that happens. Every 10 ticks it advances the season, which does all sorts of things with the weather and world map and local. And it checks for plot elements like diplomats and sieges. Then it hits some things that it does every tick. Fluids and other map tile information is advanced, though there are various optimizations here so that not every tile is necessarily checked every turn. And there are various flags so that entire sections of the map can be skipped if nothing happened. Uh, running running around are updated and other events on the map like active fires are handled. If a flag is set, wounded thirsty or hungry dwarves that can't care for themselves get an update and every so often dead dwarves think about their burial arrangements so that jobs can be set. And that would also this part right here where dead dwarves think about their burial arrangements, that's also going to tell the game if it should create that dwarf as a ghost, if it should bring it back as a ghost. Caged and other chained creatures update their thoughts and situation periodically, then creatures leave the map if they are set to at the edges. Every 50 ticks staggered from other updates all of the taverns, temples, libraries, etc. get their information updated. Stockpiles staggered on a different tick also work this way. Similarly, with storage job creation, though that process is complicated with various optimizations, lengthening ping times and so forth, and it's slow since at some point 50,000 plus boulders will cause trouble. Yeah, so this is the reason for the Atom Smasher. Once you get that many boulders, you should need to you need to really limit them. Every thousand ticks, objects that have been marked for deletion and removed from the game are actually deleted and freed. This happens more often with items every 50 ticks, along with a building use check, uh, which mostly updates for wells and some other flags that often need checking. We hit another every tick update at this point, projectiles. Um, Activities which range from dances to martial training and storytelling get updated as needed. Dwarves and other creatures decide on and advance their immediate actions, uh, movement to adjacent tiles, working at workshops, etc. The bulk of their AI outside job selection is here. Every hundred ticks items are rotted, every tick vegetation is advanced, and there are various staggers and flags here. Building states are updated every tick as needed, and minecarts are moved. Hauling routes are advanced. Temperature is updated. There are various optimization flags here, but this is still unfortunately a slow process. Finally, the camera is updated to follow the creature you are following, if any. I'm going to play a portion of an interview with Tarn that... Um, he talks about the programming of Dwarf Fortress, and um, the link for that will be in the description of this video as well. The main problem, though, is once you've got all that stuff and you keep building it up, the game gets slower and slower and slower. And for us, um, optimization's not been about finding just the one thing that'll make it all run faster. It's just a thousand different little things that give you 1%, and then you profile again and check and fix another little thing. Um, we've got hundreds of creatures running around at once, tens of thousands of items. We've got the fluids flowing. Uh, we've got buildings and machines that people make. They make these computers. Uh, those need to run. Uh, we've got um, you know, projectiles flying around on occasion. All the jobs and thoughts of the dwarves. And then the entire world outside with the uh, the weather system is one of the ones that really bogged it down because we made that a little too complicated. But um, the new version's got armies running around uh, outside while you're playing. And the populations grow and the populations shrink. And uh, there's all the politics going on. And so that needs to, no matter how much you add, we need to keep that running. Running fast, and there's nothing special about how that runs. It's all just sequential kind of calls on, uh, uh, you know, here's running the Berman events, here's running flows. There are lots of things that are staggered by timers. Like uh, this, this thing will happen on uh, turn 60 out of 100. This one will happen on 80. This one will happen on 40, and just sort of smeared out to make sure that um, no particular moment in time. If you did them all on zero, you get kind of this every second. You get this kerchunk, kerchunk, kerchunk. So spreading things out has been very important. And in, in general, we we try not to do things that don't need to be done. So fluids have all kinds of flags kind of set up in this ox tree uh, type setup that 
uh, if this square or this section has no fluids, it'll have a flag, so it doesn't even check it. And then it'll kind of drill down to where the active fluids are, checking the flags. And then those fluids are staggered every 16th square uh, will get a, get checked every 16th frame. And they're trying, we try to keep it at 100 frames a second. So that's why you see the water, if you've played the game and had, had a piece of water on top of a, a sheet of water, one level higher up, you have one thing of water. It kind of moves in this sort of line pattern that wiggles around because it's being checked every so often and then moves in a direction that's set because we can't have any randomization calls in there because it's too slow. So it's, it's, it, it looks bad in these very specific examples, but on the other hand, we've got water pressure and so on in this 3D map uh, and uh, it all works out. Like, um, if, if you've got the, the tube with the water pressure here and, and you've got this, this one shorter, then you want it to equalize. But the, the uh, you can't, it's, it's, it's difficult to do that. I don't know if it's possible. It might be possible to do that as a, a sort of local, local cellular automaton or whatever. Um, but we just say, okay, this, any, any, any piece of fluid is, is tagged as not stable at first, and then it will check below itself, look down, look for a place that, that's about as high as itself, that the first empty place it gets and then it picks the lowest one to spit itself up. So it's a, it's an expensive flood fill, but the second that flood fill fails, it marks everything that it went through as, um, that it can, I mean, that, that it can legally mark as uh, static. So none of those ever get checked again. So there's these rare flood fills when a piece of water falls on another piece of water, it floods out, tries to do the pressure code, and then it kind of, then you've got a stable lake again. The flood fill failed, so it added the flag to stop checking this part of the map for pressure. So pressure no longer goes through this steel grate. The water won't flow through a steel crate. It'll only pressurize through it. This whole um, mass of water counts as one water body. So if I dig like right here, um, or right here, that's gonna affect the situation where the game code itself is gonna recheck this body of water for pressure and flow. And when it rechecks, this activates again and fills. Um, right here, I built a floodgate and hooked it up to a lever down here. And no matter what happens, this, this floodgate can go up and down and um, it doesn't make a difference. So if you go over to my YouTube channel and go to the playlist section, I created this new playlist of um, Tarn Adams interviews where he talks about development and programming and stories. Uh, I'm gonna focus. I'm gonna try to focus this playlist on the development and programming of Dwarf Fortress. So I'm still gonna go through and uh, I may add some. I may remove some. This one here that looks like it's in Russian. They they have a translator for him because he's talking to a few um, Russian fans. So thank you very much for watching and subscribe for more videos.